Once again today we greet you in that name that's far above every name, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. May God bless you. We thank God for the beautiful day. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium here in the church in Athens. I have a hope to be a real inspiration to you during the hour coming up. Now remember the song, the music, the message will be on tape, tape number 333. I'm speaking on the subject, there's no accidents with God. Take your Bible today and turn to Romans chapter 8. There may be some of you going through a real period of testing. Maybe some of you despondent. Maybe some of you wondering why that certain things happened like it did. And if you're a child of God, I want to tell you there's no accidents with God and this message should help you. And I want you to listen closely to what I have to say. If you're having problems in your home, you're having sickness, you're having perplexity, having difficulty, then remember this message can help you as a child of God. If you're not saved, if you get right with God, you can find consolation from the message. And I'm reading from Romans chapter 8. And turn there in the scriptures where you please. I'll give you the page number in just a moment. I'm going to turn into it myself. Romans chapter 8. That's why you find that great and marvelous verse of scripture that's been used by so many Christians. It's page 1202 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. I do have a few of the Schofield Reference Bibles in my study. I always keep a few on hand if possible and I can save anybody from $10 maybe or more on the Bible. I'm not in the Bible selling business but I do it to help God's people and if I can get them at a discount where I can save you say 10 or $12 on the Bible, I'm always glad to do so. And if you're interested in this Schofield Reference Bible, you might talk to me about it or write in or call me. Uh, we'd be glad to see what we can do in that respect. A lady some time ago, two or three weeks ago, wrote in and wanted one of the Bibles. And I heard from, I believe, yesterday and said, Preach Edwards, that's just what I wanted. I, that's the Bible I wanted, the Schofield Reference Bible, the old original Schofield Reference Bible. One good thing about this Bible is that every... Uh, chapters on the same page. If you get, get rid of your Bible or use it and need a new one, you get another Schofield Reference Bible, you find the same page number. And then I use it to preach in, and it's a Bible I've been using since God saved me. And it's a Bible mostly used by preachers over the nation. And uh, when I give the page number, see, you can turn there very quickly. That's why that I like for you members to have it, because when I give you the page number before I read my text, you can turn there more quickly and follow me as I read the scriptures. So today I'm reading from page 1202. Page 1202, Romans chapter 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the heart knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh an accession for the saints according to the will of God. For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, them who are thee called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Move whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he called, them he also justified. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession? Now look at verse 28. You know why this verse is found in the Bible? You ought to memorize it because it can be helpful. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things, not a few things, 
not some things, but all things work together for the good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now you may say, Preach Edwards, how in the world can what happened to me be to the glory of God and how can it work together for the good? Well, if you listen to this message, you'll find out. See, God knows the future. God knows all things. Now little finite minds cannot comprehend some of the great things of God that he, because he knows. And if you're having problems, if you're troubled, if you have difficulty, if you're discouraged, you need this message. I want you to get it. You listen to me as I try to help you from the word of God. If you don't need it today, you might need it next week. You might need it later on as you travel down life's highway. There's no accidents in the working of God. Now you need to realize that. No accidents and, uh, because of what you've done or where you are right now. No accidents. You're not here by accidents. You must remember that. You're not saved by accidents. You must remember that. And you're not going through your testings and trials and problems by accident. You must remember that. There's none with God. Now watch this thought as I pass it on to you. It was no accident that Pharaoh's daughter found little Moses in the bulrush. That was a little child born into this family. And Pharaoh had issued for his decree that all male children be put to death, thrown to the crocodiles in the Nile River. And they saw this little child, that he was a goodly child, so they hid him as long as they could. And then when they saw they could hide him no longer, because they knew it would mean death for them and death for the child, if he was discovered. So his mother and dad fixed a little ark out of bulrush, a fixed a little ark and planted among the bulrush out in the Nile River. And they planted that little ark there and put little Moses in it. He wasn't Moses at that time, just the baby. He's given the name Moses later. And they put him there in the river, the Nile River. And of course, I have been there a few times myself and seen the place. And so they placed him there. And then they knew that would be the place where Pharaoh's daughter would come and do her daily swim, take a bath there in the river. And they knew that she would see that child. And they figured she might have compassion on the child. So they hid the little fellow there in the little ark, then the bulrush, and sure enough, here comes Pharaoh's daughter to come and get her daily swim and bath and so forth. But in the meantime, Moses' sister hid in the bushes to see what had happened to little Moses. And so this Pharaoh's daughter was taking her daily bath in the river, and she heard a baby cry. And she looked, and lo and behold, there was a little ark. And she looked in that ark, and there was a little baby. No doubt one of the cutest little babies she'd ever laid eyes on. And she said, that's one of the Hebrew babies. And maybe Moses, he cried and maybe smiled at her. And she said, I want it. She had a, a mother's heart evidently, and she wanted that baby. It's so cute. And she said, I'm going to take this baby. And it's one of the little Hebrew babies, and I'll take it. And said, I found him here in the river. I'm going to call him Moses because I found him here in the river. And whenever she took that baby, then Moses' sister, hiding out there, Miriam hiding out there in the, in the bushes, went up to Pharaoh's daughter and said, uh, I noticed you took that baby out of the river there. Oh, yes, she said. I, it's a cute little thing, and I want to keep it. I want it to be mine. She said, well, would you like to have a nurse to take care of that baby for you? You're going to need a nurse. And she said, yes, I would. Would you find me a nurse? She said, yes. And she ran back to Moses' own mother and told her that Pharaoh's daughter had found the baby and she wanted a nurse. And would she be a nurse to the child? And if she would, she could take care of the baby and yet pay for it. She'd pay her salary for taking care of it. And so Moses' own mother read her own child and received wages for doing so. That was no accident. God worked it out in that manner. Read Exodus chapter 2 verses 5 and 6. That didn't just so happen. That was designed and planned by the hand of God. And there God worked it out that Moses might grow up in Pharaoh's palace and learn all the wisdom of the Egyptians to be a mighty man in valor, a mighty warrior, and later lead God's people out of the Egyptian bondage. That was no accident. Somebody might say, well, that was just, just happened, you know. That was an accident that uh, she found that baby. No, 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 no accident there. And then secondly, 
it was no accident when the Ishmaelites were coming along when jo Joseph was being mistreated by his brethren. Uh, Genesis chapter 37 and verse 25. Little Joseph, a fine boy, a man that loved God, a young boy that loved God, had gone out to check on his brethren to see how they were doing. And they hated him because of his dreams. He had dreamed some dreams that implied that they would sooner or later bow down to him and he would rule over them. They didn't like that. And they saw him coming. They said, here comes this dreamer. And they want to do away with him. They want to kill him. But one of his brothers said, no, we, we don't want to do that. Uh, let's just put him in a pit out here and uh, let him stay in that pit. He can't get out. Just leave him in there. They were a long way from home. And so they put him in that pit. But one of his brothers uh, knew what he had planned to do. When the other brothers were not around, he would slip and take him out of that pit. But lo and behold, while they were sitting there thinking and, and maybe having their lunch, and all of a sudden they saw a caravan coming, headed toward Egypt, the Midianites. And they saw this caravan coming, and they said, the Ishmaelites run, they said, why don't we just... Um, Take him up out of that pit. We can get something out of him. We'll sell him. And they lifted up little Joseph out of that slime pit. And, and the Ishmaelites came along. And they said, we got a boy here. We'll sell you. You're going down in Egypt. You can go down there and resell him. Make some money out of him. And let him be a slave in Egypt. And so they sold Joseph for a certain amount of money. And there they put him on the camels. And started on down to the land of Egypt. And you know what happened? Later on, he became prime minister in the land of Egypt. Later on, he became Pharaoh's right-hand man. Later on, we find that he was the one that provided food for his brethren and his, his father. Now, that was no accident. It was no accident whenever uh, Joseph came walking in the field. And lo and behold, he said to a man standing there, it's no accident that man was standing there. He said, can you tell me where my brethren are? I'm looking for my brethren. They were out here kin for the sheep. He said, yes, I heard them talking the other day. And they said they're going down to um, uh, uh, Dothan. And you'll find them in Dothan. It was no accident that this man was standing there and overheard the brothers of Joseph because that directed him to where they were. And so he went to them, and of course, you know the story. If you read the story of Joseph, one of the most touching stories in the Bible. And it was no accident. So he ends up down in Egypt as a slave. He was lied on and thrown in prison. And he had a rough time, but God was with him. And God gave him visions and dreams as to what to do. That was no accident. No accident. What's the, oh, you say preach yeah, that just No, it didn't just happen. That was a plan, the direct plan of God for little Joseph. He was a good boy and loved his dad. His mother died giving birth to his brother uh, Benjamin. And so it was, it was no accident that he was sold down there in the land of Egypt. And the, the Bible tells us that in Genesis chapter 15 verse 20, later on when he was talking with his brothers, when they came down to get corn, he said, but it's for you, you thought it evil against me. But God made it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people. And so he told them, now don't, don't blame yourself. Don't be angry at yourself. You, of course you did wrong whenever you sold me down here, but that was the hand of God. God permitted that to happen because, because God knew this famine was coming and God knew there must be some food provided. And so God sent me on ahead to take care of you later on. And so it was no accident. Now, some of you listen to me today, you have wondered why in the world am I having these problems? Why in the world am I in ill health? Why in the world does it seem that everything is going wrong? Why does it seem that nothing seems to work out right? Why does it seem like I just can't get my prayers through? Why are these things happening to me? Well, now be patient. Be patient. There's a God in heaven, and this is not an accident. And God knows what he's doing. And God knows what your problem is. And God knows what you're suffering. God knows more about it than you do. And just rest your case with God. And exercise faith in God. Oh, you say, preacher, you don't know how I'm suffering. Well, God does. 
Rest your case with God. Many of a person has suffered tremendously and couldn't understand it, but they'd rest the case with God. Job, for instance, and others. Now, it was no accident that the little maid was brought to Naaman's house. In 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 2 and 3, And the Assyrian had gone out by companies and brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. Now, Naaman was a General Douglas MacArthur of his day. and He went out in battle, and he captured a little Jewish girl over from around Samaria. And so he brought her back to Assyria. Later on, this great general contracted uh, leprosy. There his body was full of leprosy, and he knew that it meant sure death. He was a wealthy man. He was a great general, Douglas MacArthur of the Assyrian army, and the king had great faith in him, but he turned out to be a leper. But that little Jewish girl there in the home waiting on his wife and a little maid in the home, she dropped a statement that changed everything. She said to her mistress, Would my Lord was with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him his leprosy. She said to Naaman's wife, she said, You know, if he was in Samaria, there's a prophet down there by the name of Elisha. Well, he could take care of this situation. And she just dropped the thought. And then, of course, a drowning man's going to grab at every straw he can. And when Naaman heard what the little girl had said, he said, Well, uh, I couldn't lose anything by it. And he called her in and began to talk with her. She said, yes, if you'll go to the prophet Elisha, he can pray for you and he can take care of this leprosy and you can be made whole again. Now you can imagine how he felt, great general, a possibility of getting cured of leprosy when there's no cure in those days without a direct act of God. And so he said, I'll go. So he loaded himself down with some uh, silver and gold and clothes and raiment, whatever he thought he might need to take care of the old prophet, go down and get healed and, and pay him for what he's done. But later on, if you read the story, you find Elisha wouldn't take any pay. But anyway, he went down and to make a long story short, he was healed. Elisha told him when he went down and, and out in the yard and somebody said, uh, preacher, there's a great general out there and a Syrian general out there he wants to see you. See, Elisha didn't even get up and go out to the door to see him. He said, you go tell him to jump in the river. In other words, you go down there and tell him if he wants to be healed to get out there in that muddy Jordan and duck himself seven times in the water. Oh, Naaman said, not me. He said, back in uh, Assyria, in Damascus, there's two beautiful rivers there. I've seen those rivers. They are beautiful. And he said, there's two beautiful rivers there. And the water's clear, and me go down here and, and duck myself in that muddy Jordan. At that time of the year, it was muddy. He said, not me. I, I can go back to Damascus. If he wants to heal me, I can go back there and get in some good, clean water. Elisha said, you go jump in the river, or you going to die. If you, you go duck yourself seven times in muddy Jordan, or go on and die with leprosy. And he said, well, I, I, I just won't do it. He had too much pride. He just wouldn't do it. And his servant said, you know, sir, said, you don't have a thing to lose. Well, you're going to die if you don't get it up. You don't have a thing to lose if you go down there and duck yourself in that water. He said, well, uh, I'll try it. So he went down and waded out into muddy Jordan and ducked himself seven times in that muddy river. And out he came, his skin like a baby skin, as clean as could be. No leprosy, completely healed. That was no accident. It, uh, it was an accident that he captured that little Jewish maiden, brought her back to his home, and she was a maiden. That, that was no accident. That was the hand of God. God worked that out. No doubt the little girl wondered, what in the world am I doing over here in Assyria? My people back in Samaria. And uh, God was going to use her. And God greatly used her. No doubt about that. Now, it was no accident then that the little lad had a lunch of loaves and fishes, had some loaves and fishes a day that Jesus fed the multitude. In John chapter 6 and verse 9, there's a little lad here, which have five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? Now Jesus is coming through, and a great crowd's following him, and seeing his miracles, and little boy said to his mama one day, you know, daddy said, mama said, uh, Jesus is coming, and 
and I'd like to see it. I'd like to see him perform some miracles. Or they say he can even raise the dead. And mama, I, I, I'd like to go, if you, if you don't care, I'd like to go and, and be with the crowd today and see Jesus do some things. And she said, all right, son, I, it's all right with me for you to go, but you know, you'll be gone probably all day. And said, you're going to need a little lunch. Said, if you just wait, I'll fix you up a nice little lunch. And then at lunchtime, when you get hungry, you can step aside and you can eat the lunch and you'll feel all right. He said, Mama, that's, that'll fi that's fine. And she took the little five barley loaves, that's five little round biscuits, not a huge loaf like you'd buy today. Five little barley loaves, barley bread, if you please, barley loaves, and two little fishes. And she fixed them all up for that little fella. And she put them in that uh, uh, container, whatever he had to carry him along, a box or what, not a basket. And she said, son, here is your lunch. You go with Jesus and see what he does. And I hope you'll have a good time today, son. You be careful and look after your lunch now because you'll be hungry if, if you don't eat in due time. He said, mom, I'll do that. I, I appreciate it. He told his mother goodbye, and he was walking around, just a little fellow among the crowd. And there's thousands of people there, men and women. And uh, long about time they would eat, everybody's hungry. They didn't have anything to eat. And the, the apostles began to say, what in the world are we going to do? Here we are, thousands of people out here, nothing to eat. Everybody's hungry. If some of these people, they came a long way, and if they tried to go back home, they'd faint and fall by the wayside. They'd never make it. They're so hungry. What in the world are we going to do? And they kept murmuring around there. And finally, Andrew, he spotted that little boy. And he had a little nosy about it. He wanted to find out what he had in that basket. He said, son, what do you got there? He said, uh, mama fixed me a little lunch. And I have five little biscuits and two little fish. And old Andrew took a good look at that. He went over and told Simon Peter. And they told Jesus, said, uh, there's no food around here. We couldn't buy enough for this crowd. And if they left here and went home, they'd fall by the wayside. And said, so little boy over there said, he's got, he's got five biscuits and two fish, but why, well, what is that among this crowd? And they told Jesus. They said, Jesus, there's a little boy there with a little lunch. He's got five biscuits and two fish. Jesus said, bring him here, son. Bring him here. They brought that little boy over to Jesus. And Jesus said, let me have your food, son. The little fella hand his food to Jesus. Little as much, you know, when God is in it. And Jesus just began to pass it out to the disciples. Just kept passing out. Every time they'd give out those busy fish, the more would jump up. He just passed it on out. And he fed that multitude with five biscuits and two little fish. That was no accident. You think it was an accident because that boy had that little bite? No, no, that was no accident. God had that worked out. God was going to perform a miracle. God would feed that people and show them that he was God, that he could perform. That was no accident with that little boy. You can imagine how he looked whenever he saw that great multitude fed with his little food that he brought with him that day. And the Bible said they took up uh, 12 baskets left over. Jesus said uh, to his apostles, I want you to take up what's left over. We don't want to waste any things, to send the waste. You take up what's left over. And they took up 12 basketfuls. Each apostle had a basketful to go on their way and to eat it or use it to help others. Jesus don't, didn't believe in wasting anything. Now that's one of the great sins of America today. We waste a lot of our goods. We waste a lot of our food. We waste a lot of things when we should not. You ought to be saving and not waste your food. We throw more food in the garbage cans today than it takes to feed the other nations that are starving to death. People are starving to death in Ethiopia and Africa and India and the other places, and we throw away more food than it takes to feed them. You think God's pleased with that? No, sir. We need to be saving with what we have. God wants us to be saved. No, you don't have to be a skint flint and a tight wad, but you need to be saving with what you have and not waste and throw it. We're living in a rich land. The richest nation in the world. And we were throwing away and wasting much of our goods. I don't know how long God will put up with that. But that's a sin that America is committing. No accident. 
Then there was no accident that, that Paul's nephew was standing around listening one day when he heard 40 men say we're going to form a conspiracy and we'll, uh, we're going to put Paul to death. We're not eat a bite of anything until he's dead. Paul's nephew slipped around and told Paul, said, Paul, I just heard something. He said there's 40 men out there and they said they wouldn't eat a bite until they killed you. And Paul said, let me go tell, go tell the guard. Go tell the man's in charge. He slipped around and told the man that's in charge what he had heard. And the great man in charge, the general, said, let's get Paul out of here. And see that he's not killed by those 40 men. And so they slipped Paul out by night and sent him on down to Caesarea. Now those 40 men, they said, we're not going to eat a bite until we kill Paul. So I guess they starved to death. No, the old hypocrites, they got them something to eat when they found out they couldn't get Paul. But anyway, it was no accident that Paul's little nephew was standing there with his ears open. And he overheard that conversation. And that was a means of saving Paul's life. You think that was an accident? No, sir. That was a hand of God. God worked that out. A lot of things that's happened in your life you can't understand. You've talked with others. You've tried to figure out. You want to get their ideas. You want to know what they think about it. It's no accident with God. God knows what he's doing. Wait, be patient. Exercise faith in God. There's no accident for God Almighty. You must remember that. And then it was no accident when the Samaritan woman one day found a man sitting on Jacob's well. John chapter 4 verses 6 through 7. And that man was none other than Jesus. That was no accident. You think it was just an accident that she went down to that well and lo and behold, that said a man. No, no. Jesus said to his apostles, I must needs go through Samaria. And Jesus knew he must go through Samaria. And he knew he must go to this well. He knew that woman was coming. And he sat down. And when she came, he told her about the water of life. She came to draw water. Out of Jacob's well, he told about the water of life. And she was gloriously saved and went back in the village and led a multitude of men out there. And they got saved. And Jesus stayed there two days of saving people. As a result of what happened to that woman, she was a woman of bad character, bad reputation. That woman had been married five times and then was living with a man. As the old saying is, they shacking up with a man she wasn't married to. You know, that's wrong, that's weak, and that's sinful. For anybody to live together, man and woman, like husband and wife and not married, that's, that's a sinful, wicked thing. It's, a, it's committing adultery, and it's not pleasing to God. It's a wicked sin. Don't care who does it. Too many people doing that today, living together, men and women, not married, and that's wrong. Did you know that 80%, now you listen to this, 80% of all men and women that live together before they marry, separate and divorce after they marry. 80% of them. If you're shacking up with some man or woman and you're thinking about getting married, you might well be thinking about that divorce on down the road because you're not going to make it. You won't live together long. Very few ever live together after they get married. Now, as long as they don't get married... While they can live together because they're living in sin and so forth. And they get a thrill out of that. I'm living with a woman I'm not married to. I'm living with a man I'm not married to. And, and that'll keep them together because it's weak and evil. But one time they get married, then the battle starts. The fussing starts. The quarreling starts. And the first thing you know, a separation comes. Eighty percent of all couples that live together before they marry separate sooner or later. You better listen to this Baptist preacher. I'm telling you something. You thinking about living with a man or living with a woman and you want to be your husband and wife. You better listen to this preacher. It's not going to work out. Now that's what happened here. This woman had been married five times and shacking up with a man she wasn't married to. And when Jesus Christ saved her, all that went under the blood and she cleaned her life up and became a soul winner and was greatly used of God. No accident. Now you listen to me. It is no accident that you are where you are right now. All you say, preach, it was I just happened to come along and just happened to be. No, you didn't. You're right here today because God sent you here. It's no accident. Now you listen to me out there on the radio. Listen to all this. Now don't, don't cut this radio off. You listen to this Baptist preacher. It's no accident that you're listening to me today. God is having you to listen to me. God wanted you to listen to me. And you better hear what I'm telling you. Because something's going to happen down the road and you wish you had. 
It's no accident that you tuned in to this great radio station and listened to this Baptist preacher right now. That's no accident. God had you to do that. And you better heed what I'm saying and beware of it because you're soon coming to the end of life's journey. It's no accident one day when I was crossing a little uh, pathway going from a uh, street over in the city of Greenville, South Carolina to the Dunian Mill where I was employed at the time, me and my wife, as a general rule, she walked in front of me and I walked behind and had Joan in my arms and she was a baby. And a lady attended her across the railroad over in the village. We were going over there to leave her to go to work and uh, I was in front this time. That's no accident. I walked right into some acid. They had dug up an old tank to get the metal for war purposes, poured the stuff out on the ground. It was type acid they used to consume flesh. And I walked in that stuff and uh, my feet started burning. I looked down and my pants are eating off to my knees almost. My socks is eating off. My shoes is folding up. And I jumped back and they rushed me to the hospital. And, and it didn't burn very deep. They only left scars on the top of my feet. Didn't damage any muscles or bones. And I was flat on my back. And I went home. And while I was flat on my back, my mother came and the preacher came. And that was a turning point in my life. And that's why I'm here today. Oh, you say, preach, you had an accident. Then you walked in some acid. No, that's no accident. That's no accident. God had it to work out that way. God struck me now. That's the only way God could stop me. And God struck me down. And that's why I'm here today. And that happened many years ago in about 1940. That's no accident. It's no accident that you where you are and doing what you're doing. Now, let me give you this as I close. And I want to read this, and you listen to it. Not why, but what? My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. When trouble or trying circumstances come our way, we often ask, why did this happen to me? It would be better if we would ask, what can I learn from this? What is God teaching me? Ruth Paxton, a Paxton missionary to China, during the part, first part of this century, told of a woman who boarded a train with her in Finland. The first thing Miss Paxson noticed was a radiant face. But then she observed that the woman's right hand was missing. In his place was a steel hook. As they talked, Miss Paxson learned that she had been a missionary in India and had contracted a lung disease, had been sent home to die. So she turned to a native Finland, bought a farm, worked big slip. One day while she was working on the thrashing machine, her right hand was cut off. Now, as the two talked on, on, on the train, she told Miss Paxton, when my hand was cut off, I immediately looked up to my Lord and said, Lord, what do you want me to do now that my right hand is gone? What work? I'm not asking why, but what? God used her to turn a farm into a home filled with Christians, bringing blessings to many. Having adverse circumstances coming into life, they are there by design. Our nature is, is to question God's working, but this delay is a demonstration of His strength. His purpose is to show the genuineness of our faith and sufficient of His grace. Stop asking why, then ask God, can God show you what? Oh Lord, I would not ask you why these trials come my way, but what is there for me to learn? Of your great love, I pray. Those who bless God in their trials will be blessed by God through their trials, unquote. Whatever happens to you is no accident. This woman lost her arm, and losing her arm, she turned her home into a place for aged Christian people that they might come and have a home. And God greatly hadn't lost her arm, it wouldn't happen. What's happening to you is going to read down to the glory of God sooner or later. If you'll be reconciled to the will of God and rest in faith and believe God, quit word and threaten and and just say, God, I'm looking to you now. I'm going to let you guide me step by step because this is no accident. This is happening in my life. Let's stand our feet. Our Father, I pray today that you'll take the message and use it. It's no accident, dear Father, that I walked in that acid that day. As I look back many times, dear Father, I know that was no accident. Everybody called an accident. They said uh, Edwards had an accident, walked into some accident. No, no, Father. It was no accident. Because I walked into that acid, number of people you've saved through my feeble efforts. Churches have been established. Almost 40 years of daily radio preaching. Lord, it's no accident. 
You knew what you were doing and you did it the way you wanted to do it and allowed it to happen like you wanted it to happen. And I thank you for it, dear God. And there's no accident, God, with thee. Whatever happens can read down to the glory of God. Bless thy people, help thy people, and help us to remember that all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord that are thee called according to his purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Debbie, play a couple of stanzas. Now you listen to me. If God is speaking to you to come forward for any reason, come on down here. Let me help you. If God is speaking to you about that, join the church. Come back to God. Rededicate your life. Whatever God is telling you to do, obey the Lord while, while Debbie plays for us. Would you come? accidents with God not for his people if you're God's child no accidents with God 